We are calling our current sermon series Degrees of Separation. And over the last couple of weeks, we have been exploring what it means to be set apart as those who belong to and those who serve our most holy God. And we've been asking ourselves, what does it mean to be holy because he is holy? And Pastor Todd started us off a couple of weeks ago talking about a life of worship, how God wants us to treat him as the one we love and adore above all others. You know, what, is it, what does it mean to please God, not just as the one who loved us first, but as the one who is infinitely worthy of our love and our worship? And then last week, Pastor Ron introduced us to Daniel, a, a, a Jewish teenager living in exile but also a young man set apart to serve the living God. And if you remember, Pastor Ron taught us that the Jewish nation had ignored the warnings of the prophets. They were conquered by the Babylonian Empire. And Daniel was one of those who was exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And we learned that the Jews who got carted off to Babylon were the elite. They were the privileged. They were the ones, the royals and the nobles and the educated. In other words, the ones that their uh, captors wanted to neutralize because those were the people who could leverage a comeback. And when we met him last week, Daniel was a, a young man, and he was forced to serve in King Nebuchadnezzar's court. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to catch up with Daniel some 70 years later. For his entire adult life, he lived in captivity, and we think by the end of his life, he had served under at least four different rulers, and he always functioned at a very high level in the government because he had a gift that his captors wanted to take advantage of. He had this really incredible prophetic gift and the ability to interpret dreams and visions, and if you read the book of Daniel, that that makes up the bulk of that book. Last week, what we saw was the before picture. So we saw Daniel, the young man, and Pastor Ron showed us how Daniel drew distinct boundary lines. And then he lived within those lines regardless of the consequences. This week, we're going to look at the after picture. And we thought it would be really helpful to examine the life of someone who had set himself apart from the culture as God's own for seven decades at least, and then see the outcome of such a life. A little bit like somebody who's been lifting weights for years to see that before and after picture, somebody who decides to stick to a diet for a few months. You see the before and after picture. In the later chapters of the book of Daniel, we see a life that has been set apart for God, seeking God, prioritizing God over and over and over until what we see is this beautifully shaped holy life. It's a story of transformation. That's what we're going to jump into here. We're going to go to Daniel 9. If you want to join me, you can grab your pew Bible right in front of you. It's page 886. This is Daniel chapter 9, and in the very first verses, we're going to find Daniel, and we think he's between 80 and 85 years old. And he's pondering the meaning of the prophet Jeremiah's words, his prophecy that Jerusalem would remain desolate for 70 years. Desolate meaning leveled abandoned, deserted. And Daniel writes in the first two verses here in the first person. And he says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, so it's just another ruler, another day, another ruler, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So in other words, Daniel, the old man, has done the math. He's read his Bible, and that his gift of prophecy has his radar turned way up, and frankly, he is ready for this captivity thing to be over, and he's asking the question, could Jeremiah be right? Could Jeremiah be right, and Israel's about to be fully restored for good? Well, Daniel's next move is our first clue as to who Daniel has become. Look at verse 3. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy, with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. 
Now, this is a little bit grimmer than what we saw last week, but it's very similar to what we saw in Daniel chapter 1. Remember how last week, in, early in his life, he decided to forego the meat and the wine that was offered to him at the king's table for 10 days. In essence, what Daniel was doing is he was fasting. And here we find him doing the same thing all these years later. And here's the thing. If you jump ahead to chapter 10, you'll see him do it again. In that case, it'll be meat and wine again that he'll be giving up, and he'll do it for three weeks. Now in his 80s, Daniel is still relying on habits formed early. So for those of you who are are teenagers sitting in this room, and we do have a number of you this morning, those of you who are young adults, pay close attention to this. Uh, One of my favorite Christian philosophers, Dallas Willard, he said, you must arrange your life so that you are experiencing deep joy, contentment, and confidence in your everyday life with God. This is basically what Daniel did. Now, he had, he had some serious constraints, to be sure. He lived his entire life as a prisoner of war. His, his outer life, his role in this foreign government um, was not his choice, right? The fact that he had to spend his entire life in this foreign culture was not his choice. But he did have the power to arrange his inner life And that fasting and that prayer that he embraced as a young man, it now informs the way that he processes events that come his way now as an old man. So, you know, any crisis that arises, any issue that comes up, any matter of discernment, he goes straight back to those habits that he formed early. So if you're young, pay close attention. If you're not, if you're old like me and you're going whoa, I wish I had adopted some of those habits earlier. I have one word for you. Flossing. Flossing. I I have two more words for you. Seatbelts. We've learned to do things that we didn't do when we were young. We can do it again. We can. We can adopt new habits. We can adopt new spiritual disciplines. But But if you're young, it's better because at the end of his life, Daniel is relying on these habits. And it didn't just, it didn't just influence, but it actually determined who he would become. It set a trajectory for his entire life. Now, the second thing that stands out here about Daniel is that this man, he knows how to pray, okay, by this point in his life. And his approach to prayer, I think, is really quite fascinating. In verses 4 through 19, um, we're not going to read it, but I I suggest that you do. You find Daniel's beautiful prayer to the Lord, and he's praying that this exile would come to an end, and his sense is that after 70 years, it has to be time for this to be over. And so he intercedes on behalf of the nation of Israel, and his prayer, those those verses 4 through 19, are summed up in verse 20. But more importantly, verse 20 describes his prayer practice. So, so look, at, look at verse 20 with me, please. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. Let me read that again. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, the holy hill being Jerusalem. So four words right there, speaking, praying, confessing, presenting. These four words, they they draw a picture of a mature prayer life. This is the guy who's been doing this for a really long time. I'm not going to bore you, mostly, with a Hebrew grammar lesson, um, but you do need to know that none of these words, none of these four words is, is being used in an everyday, common, run-of-the-mill sense of the word. These are very carefully chosen words that are used to describe a carefully cultivated practice. And the first word is speaking. Speaking. Now, the verb tense here, it, it, it's, it indicates that his speech to God has been intensified. I, I kind of love this because what it implies is that Daniel talks to God different kinds of ways. He speaks to God in different kinds of voices. And in this particular case, he's raised his voice a little. 
He has intensified his speech. I watched the movie Fiddler on the Roof again recently, and I was reminded of the fact that the main character, Tevye, also Jewish, by the way, talks to God all the time, all day long. He talks while he's working. He talks as he's getting ready to go to bed. He jokes with God. He laughs with God. He whines to God. He complains to God. But when his daughters start messing with tradition, he raises his voice to God. He says, this is serious, God. Lord, I really need you to listen. This is the voice that Daniel is now speaking with. And and let me just stop and comment here. If you don't do this, if you don't ever speak to God with your voice raised a little, would you please start? You know, you know, the thing is, is that we see that, that verse that says, pray without ceasing. And some of us find that to to just be overwhelming. But what if the channels of communication were always open? Well, they are. If you have the Holy Spirit, they're, they're open. They're wide open. Jesus died so that you would have that incredible gift, that incredible privilege. And you can speak to God literally all day and all night. But what Daniel teaches us is you can also raise your voice a little. You can intensify your speech when things get serious. The next one is praying. Now, this is interesting because he's speaking and he's praying. Prayer is another one of these interesting words in the Hebrew. Again, I'll I'll try not to torture you, but it it matters. This word, it matters the verb tense that it's in because it's getting used in a very specific way. Prayer is in the middle voice, which basically means it's not active, it is not passive, it's in the middle voice. I think this helps us understand our role in prayer. So Daniel is not active This is not an active thing. It means he's not doing something to God. He's not acting on God. He's not manipulating God, which, by the way, is very important as those who worship a most holy God. We must never, never forget that God is God and we are not. But Daniel's not being passive either. He's not being acted upon. God is not manipulating Daniel either. God's not treating him like a puppet because God never wanted that. God only ever wanted relationship. So that's why I love that this word prayer is used in the middle voice. Eugene Peterson taught that in the middle voice of prayer, we neither manipulate God nor are we manipulated by God. We are involved in the action, we participate in its results, but we do not control or define it. Speaking, praying, the third one is confessing. So the bulk of Daniel's prayer in verses 4 through 19 is is confession. It's Daniel confessing his sin to God, he's confessing the corporate sin of Israel, and he's doing it both at the same time. So in other words, he's saying, I am the problem, and I am part of the bigger problem, which is the nation of Israel. And he is brokenhearted over both at the same time. So you know that you have been living a set-apart life for a long time when you begin to confess your own sin with as much sorrow as you confess the sin of the church. You know that you've begun to reach spiritual maturity when you confess the sins of the church with as many tears as your own sin. Some of us, I think, we like to to stand and we like to point at the church in judgment. And we can pick out the faults of the church all day long, but we forget those three fingers are pointing right back at us. And we forget to acknowledge our own faults. But there are others, and I know in this room, who are keenly aware of your own faults, and somehow you want to keep the church in this special bulletproof box, free of guilt and culpability. Well, neither one is right. Neither one is right. The church has plenty to confess over. Our passive, apathetic relationship with the living God, for one. Our contentment to come and go on Sunday mornings 
and then leave and not give the Lord or anything the Lord cares about a second thought till we come back together a week later. Our willingness to equate a country's politics with God's agenda. So we, we, I could go on. We have plenty to confess. Plenty to confess, both as individuals and as the church. But Daniel's prayer here is an incredible example of both confession and repentance. And as we continue on Wednesday nights, which, by the way, if you missed the last two, please come this Wednesday. Just, it's just been an incredible time. But I think that confession is ground zero for revival. I believe that is where it begins, and we need to be pressing in to, to more of that. And then this last word gets translated as presenting. Presenting, like presenting. It's not a good word. Because really what Daniel's doing is he is flat out on the ground, laying on his face with the most intense language possible. He's taking his request for favor, and he is causing it to fall down before God, and then he leaves it there. He's not causing anything to happen except to finally completely a 1,000% lay this request at God's feet. So what he's doing, it's not like he's throwing it there. It's like he's taking every bit of his heart. He's taking the deepest desire of his heart, which is for this thing to be over, and he is laying it down at God's feet. It's a special kind of prayer. It's crying. It's when you cry. It's when, it's when you, you're at your wit's end. It's when you take every bit of passion in you and you make your case, but then ultimately you set it down in front of the one who can actually do something about it. So that's the picture of Daniel praying. So who has he become after all these years? You know, we saw him early on distinguishing himself by the choices that he made. But I think what stands out when you get to the end of his life are not his fasting practices, but his prayer practices. Somewhere along the way, it it went from him living a distinct life to enjoying a distinct relationship with God. His life is no longer centered on the what, like what am I going to do for God, but it's focused on the who. He's, He's just focused on the Lord. So those spiritual practices, those boundary lines that he set early are still in place. But decades later, he has prioritized that relationship with God over and over and over for so long that he's just a different man. You can just see it. You see it in how he speaks. You see it in how he prays. You see it in how he confesses. You see it in how he lays it all out when everything is on the line. There is a profound becoming that takes place when you practice the presence of God. And it reminds me of a wonderful little story that Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote, and it's called The Great Stone Face. Maybe you're familiar with it. It's about a little boy named Ernest, and Ernest lives near a mountain, and the mountain is shaped like a human face. And there's a prophecy in this, in this village that one day someone will come. They will be the greatest person of their generation. And their face as an adult will, will bear an exact resemblance to this stone face in the mountain. And Ernest loves this face of the mountain. And along with all the other citizens of this little village, he waits for years for this prophecy to come true. But while he waits, he just admires the mountain. He loves it, has great affection for it, and great reverence for it. And over the decades, people come and people go. Well, maybe this is the one. No. Maybe this is the one. No. Meanwhile, over decades, this boy who continues to age is so in love with the face of the mountain that one day someone sees him and gasps and points because they've realized it's Ernest. Ernest is the one who looks like the great stone face. And that's really what we see here with Daniel. 
Daniel is just this remarkable picture of one who has spent so much time praying that while now he did not become God, he's still not God, he has become a man after God's own heart. There is no substitute for time spent in the presence of God. Many of you know that. But Daniel had embraced that identity so long that he was not only transformed, but he also enjoyed a very special relationship with God. And that's how I want to close. Because, of course, it's not a one-way relationship. And God is not neutral in the face of this one who has loved God with his whole life. So let's finish with verses 21 through 23. Daniel continues, he says, while I was speaking in prayer, the man, angel, Gabriel, who I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you for you are greatly loved. God's response to Daniel is to send this angel, Gabriel, who is literally caused to fly swiftly. If I were to paraphrase this, that angel flew so fast it made his head spin, okay? And we don't have time this morning for the rest of the story. It's complicated, and Daniel didn't get everything that he prayed for. That's another part of becoming. Sometimes we lay it all out with everything that we've got. And we, as we grow and we mature, we learn to be content with what God gives us, which is the realized will. What God did give Daniel was an incredible gift of seeing. God entrusts him with what will really happen. And he shows him hundreds of years into the future, I believe even a glimpse of Jesus. What stands out here for me, though, is what that swiftly flying angel called Daniel. He called him greatly loved. The angel's going to use that extraordinary term three more times in chapter 10. Now, let's be clear. Daniel is not someone who is loved more than anyone else. God's love is complete. God's love is perfect. God's love is offered to everyone. And and God's not going to unlove you because you don't pray as much as the person who's sitting next to you. But honestly, greatly loved is kind of a bad translation. I think the the better word is precious, okay? Like, Like highly treasured possession, precious one, precious Uh, precious treasure. So some of you know that I did some time in the Deep South. And um, the thing about Californians is that we like to throw Southern words, you know, like y'all around. That's just for beginners. And I I, I would like to apologize now to those of you who are really from the South, because I'm going to butcher this. But a, a true Southerner knows. They know the difference between the word precious Darling, sweet, cute, and nice. And if somebody from the the Deep South tells you you look nice, well, you've just been insulted, bless your heart. (laughs) Now, if they tell you you're sweet or cute, well, that's middle of the road. If they say you're darling, well, that's real good. But if they tell you that you're precious, they tell you your baby, your house, your outfit is precious, well, darling, you have just received the finest compliment you can get. It's the ultimate compliment to be called precious, and that is all I think the angel is doing here. The angel is bringing the ultimate compliment to Daniel straight from God Daniel, you're so precious to God. And while you may not be more loved, you're favored. God so loved the whole world. God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. But there are those 
who know God so well and who have known God for so long that they stand out. And I don't think that it's because they're necessarily preferred. It's just because they're that close. They've gotten that close to God. There is no doubt that God favors the set apart. He sends them angels. He sometimes shares with them what he's going to do. He calls them pet names. He favors them, not just because they have prioritized being set apart from the culture for their entire life, but because they have set themselves as close to the heart of God as they can get. And they have done that over and over and over for a lifetime. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we confess that we just sit here and and say, my name's Sandy, not Daniel. And, And Lord, we're sorry. And we do, we do confess our shortcomings. But Lord, we also bring our heart to you And the desire that you have put in us through the power of your Holy Spirit to be closer to your heart, to keep pushing closer and closer to you. Jesus, would you teach us? Would you keep being our teacher? Would you disciple us through your word, through one another? Teach us how to stay close to the heart of the Father. And Holy Spirit, we are so grateful that we can rely on you to convict us, to stir our hearts to remind us when we get distracted, and to woo us straight into the heart of the Father, because we do need you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen.